Hello, welcome to the Alps Winner's Call. Clearly, I'm having a lot of fun at here at Alps. Look at this snow. Um, I hope you're having as much fun as I do. Okay, so let's get started. This class is going to be about common sense and moral reasoning. Um, part of the objective of this class is to address frequently asked the questions these days that NLP or common sense or whatever is almost solved by ChatGPT, and I have an existential crisis. So this might be a case of hasty generalization. So let's look at an actual example. So we ask ChatGPT a classical Winograd schema challenge problem. So the traffic doesn't fit into the brown suitcase because it is too big. What is too big? So uh, naive physics, common sense reasoning uh, it, uh, tells us that the trophy is too big to fit into the brown suitcase. So this is correct answer. So good job, ChatGPT. But what if we ask a slightly different question? Then the machine says the trophy itself is too small to fit into the suitcase. So this is nonsense. Uh, so uh, machines today still don't really have a reliable sense of common sense. Um, nonetheless, uh, these large models or extreme scale neural models are uh, very powerful uh, in recent years. So it's almost as if we are trying to uh, uh, find out how we can uh, compete with these extreme scale neural models uh, for the leaderboard. So a bit reminiscent of a David versus Goliath situation. Uh, and especially relevant question for folks in academia and the students uh, is whether it's even possible to do impactful research without extreme scale compute available. So in order to address that question, let's draw inspirations from uh, the classical books on uh, David and Goliath, especially The Art of War. Uh, this is a gem. And the key takeaway messages of this book is to know your enemy, to choose your battles, and to innovate your weapons. Uh, of course, for this modern uh, deep neural network era, we have to reinterpret this advice as uh, follows. So knowing your enemy equates uh, coming up with good evaluation with realism and scrutiny, including adversarial and out of distribution and generative evaluation scenarios. And then choosing your battles could be about uh, designing new tasks and leaderboards where computer uh, machines cannot really game the leaderboards. And then finally, innovating your weapons can be in the form of using or designing smarter algorithms or designing better data. So in this talk, I'm going to share uh, some of our recent research that address uh, especially this last point about innovating our algorithms and data. And it's going to have roughly three parts, symbolic knowledge distillation and decoding algorithms, and then common sense morality. Although um, we will look at different types of uh, approaches and applications, the recurring theme here will be that the smaller models can be better and then uh, the knowledge is power. So let's begin with the first component about causal common sense knowledge and reasoning. So this is a symbolic knowledge distillation, uh, especially for the purpose of converting general language models to causal common sense models. Uh, but why do we care about common sense is in part because despite human level or even superhuman level performances on leaderboards, uh, today's state-of-the-art models are brittle. Uh, 
when given adversarial or out of domain examples. So uh, neural networks can make silly mistakes that humans will never make including the earlier trophy and suitcase situation that we uh, considered. So it's almost as if neural networks today know how to solve a data set without really solving the underlying task for uh, more uh, proper systematic generalization. And why is that the case? Uh, well, in part, machines learn surface patterns in the data and can demonstrate amazing generalization uh, capabilities out of it, but still doesn't really learn about how the world works in the way that humans do. So there's this fundamental gap between how humans learn and how machines learn. And part of that big gap is common sense. So what is common sense? Uh, the operational definition of a common sense in this talk will be that the basic level of practical knowledge and reasoning concerning everyday situations and events that are commonly shared among most people. Here, it's very important that uh, it's not really a true, true fact that is universally shared by everyone uh, in the world, but it's only shared by most people. And roughly speaking, these are general rules of thumb that we rely on in a day-to-day -day, uh, life. So for example, it's okay to keep the closet door open, but it's not okay to keep the fridge door open because the food inside might go bad. So this is generally true, but you know, like I sometimes, uh, um, uh, uh, I, I might go to a friend's house, for example, then I might behave and try to keep the closet door closed as opposed to keeping it open. And then uh, if you go to store and then you look at fridge in the store, they're not even plugged into the wall, in which case it's okay if the door is closed or open because there's no food inside. So there can be all these additional situations in which these types of rules of thumbs no longer apply or we might apply the rules differently depending on different situation uh, where there may be different cultural norms, there may be different moral norms even. So these are just general rules of thumb that may or may not be true always, but it's commonly shared by most people. And these are how we interact with each other. Uh, these rules are essential for humans to live and interact with each other in a reasonable and safe way and therefore uh, important for AI to understand human needs and norms and actions better because they do need to align with the human needs. So the uh, fundamental idea behind this line of work is that language models are fundamentally not identical to the knowledge models. So these two things are different. Language models, it does know a lot of knowledge, but, and yet it's not really serving as robust knowledge models. So we might need to investigate how to build such knowledge models. And so uh, we had this previous work known as Atomic and Comet. And these are, uh, Atomic is a uh, symbolic common sense knowledge graph and Comet is common sense transformers uh, that is trained on top of that atomic knowledge graph. Um, and so the symbolic knowledge distillation that I'm about to tell you is going to build on this prior work, Atomic and Comet. And importantly, Atomic up until two years ago uh, was fully crowdsourced by humans. And then we also had a follow-up follow uh, work known as Comet Atomic 2020. Again, these are some combination between symbolic and neural common sense knowledge models. So let me give you a brief summary of what Atomic 2020 looks like. So X gets X's car repaired or Sarah gets her car repaired. Imagine that situation. As a result, uh, maybe X wants to call taxi for a ride, uh, will need to pay for the bill and beforehand, that person will need a mechanic and the money. So these are sort of like preconditions and post-conditions we can reason about 
an event. And then we can also reason about physical entity or objects. So for example, money can be used for paying repairs, or you can fold that into origami if you really, really want it. I've never tried, but these are about both the stereotypical and a stereotypical use cases of objects in the world. Uh, we can also reason about counterfactual context in which the center event cannot happen. So if you total your car completely, you cannot really get it repaired anymore. Uh, so there are event-centered uh, knowledge about you know, what happens before and after and in what context some things can happen or not happen and so forth. So this was a fully crowdsourced and um, it encodes a rich knowledge about uh, common sense if then inferences over 23 different inference types or relation types. So these are 23 different edges. And then there are uh, 1.3 million if then rules, which is basically one node, one edge and another node. So again, up until two years ago, uh, it was fully crowdsourced, or maybe I should say up until three years ago, since it's New Year. Okay, so what good uh, does this kind of models serve? So let's compare our comet uh, against GPT-3. So here GPT-3 is so large, it doesn't even fit into the slide. Uh, but you can see that roughly speaking, comet is Four times, 400 times smaller compared to GPT-3. So considering that it's smaller than GPT-3, it's doing really, really well. I mean, but first of all, in terms of the accuracy of the uh, machine generated inference judged by humans. So this is um, given a node and an edge, the task is to generate uh, inference. Uh, so for that task, COMET is about 84% correct. GPT-3 is about 73% correct. So it's very impressive compared to GPT-2, which was only 36% or 36.6, good. But um, that, so that's a big jump. And we'll get back to this because it's really impressive how scale alone gave a lot of common sense knowledge to GPT-3. But the problem with GPT-3 is that it doesn't fit into anybody's machine. Uh, you know, it's hard to really adapt it to your application needs. Whereas Comet, this is much smaller, so you can easily download and use. Plus, it's much better model, at least for common sense inferences in the way that uh, we designed and tested here. So both Comet and Atomic, uh, when we make these types of resources available, so these uh, resources have been used by people all, or, all around the world uh, to do a variety of creative uh, research, including persona-aware conversations or figurative language understanding, storytelling and fantasy gaming, as well as interactive uh, learning. So since these resources seem useful for others. We wanted to enhance that, but now finally, let me tell you about symbolic knowledge distillation that uh, aims to do better than the previous atomic and comet. The idea is that we want to start with GPT-3, which was very, very impressive, and then make it much smaller, but better through this, um, new approach that we named as a symbolic knowledge distillation. Now, wait a minute, is that even possible? Because usually when we try to make a model smaller, it almost always becomes worse. So in this case, it's going to be possible because we are going to have this strange funnel where uh, there's going to be a critic sorting uh, good and bad knowledge, and then the byproduct of it is going to be symbolic knowledge graph, which can then be used for training student models. So that's a big picture. Uh, this contrasts with the original or classical knowledge distillation uh, due to Hinton et al. several years ago, 
where there's a teacher model uh, compressed down to student model by optimizing this objective function, which is cross entropy between teachers' predictions and uh, students' predictions. So the student model is trained to match the probability distribution of teacher models. Now, we cannot really do this for common sense inference that requires generating textual output because the space of output now is uh, can be any strings, which means uh, it, we cannot just enumerate them all. There can be exponentially many such uh, inferences. And in the original uh, knowledge distillation, the output variable y used to be just the classification labels, but now that's no longer the case. But that's OK, because um, machine learning folks almost always just uh, whenever there's something in impossible to enumerate and compute precisely, we approximate that using samples. So we can do that. Um, and the byproduct of that samples can be constructed into a, a symbolic knowledge graph. So we can connect the uh, pieces into uh, a graph. So there's that. And then um, let's look at uh, how the machine generated knowledge compares to human written original Atomic 2020. So let's just say Atomic 10X is what GPT-3 just generate without any critic or additional mechanism, but this is just the prompting GPT-3 to generate some common sense inferences. And here, what you see in the y-axis is quantity in millions. So Atomic 2020, with respect to a subset of relation types. So in this study, we only look at seven relation types that corresponds to causal common sense reasoning. So uh, with respect to that, the amount or quantity of atomic 2020 was less than a million. Uh, and then here you see green and black portion. So green is good portion, black is bad portion. So human written resources do have some noise. And then if we look at GPT-3 generated atomic resource, I mean, if we were to use that as a resource, then it's not a very good, it, it, first of all, it's very large, that's good. It's almost um, uh, more than 6 million, it's almost 7 million. But the problem is almost the 30% of that generated knowledge is not good. So that's how much GPT-3 knows about common sense. But what we do then is to train this small critic model. It can be based on anything, but we use the Roberta based on a moderate size supervised or annotated example of whether a knowledge is good or bad. So this critic model is not very good because uh, knowing whether generated knowledge is noisy or not in itself is a difficult common sense challenge. But what this one is capable of doing is to throw out, throw out a lot of bad stuff. So uh, this critic model, especially if we throw out examples aggressively based on how high threshold based on critic model, then we can get rid of almost all black portion. In doing so, we lost a lot of green portion but the resulting atomic 10x uh, is still much bigger than atomic 2020. And then in fact, the black portion is now relatively even smaller than before. So it's almost as if uh, we have a better quality. I mean, uh, we, we do have a better quality uh, atomic 10x compared to atomic 2020 written by humans. Now, the next question is, uh, how these different types of resources can be used to train student model. And so compared to the original GPT-3, so the original teacher model that was about 73% good, you might remember in the earlier slide. So compared to that, if we just use this noisy teacher as is, and then train a smaller model, uh, to our surprise, the student model 
performance goes up on its own. Even though student was lousy, uh, sorry, even though the teacher was lousy, the student does do better. So that's an interesting empirical uh, phenomenon that we don't know why exactly that's the case, but we found that empirically. But um, still, that's not as good as this um, third case where uh, Comet was trained on human authored common sense graph. So uh, the gold standard until recently has been that human annotated data is the best data to train models on. Now, what's really striking though is this last case where uh, now the Comet is trained on machine authored knowledge graph. That is where the machine is basically a critical teacher that combines the original GPT-3 with this tiny little critic model that throws out a lot of GPT-3 output as noisy uh, or incorrect, potentially incorrect examples. So again, critic is not very good. So it throws out a lot of good example together with the bad examples, but still the resulting model Comet uh, still performs the best uh, over uh, all the other computative baselines. So to summarize, uh, Atomic 2020 versus Atomic 10X written by machine, turns out um, for the first time, we have a machine authored knowledge graph that or knowledge base uh, that wins for the first time over a human authored knowledge base in all criteria, scale, accuracy, and diversity. Of course, this is only with respect to the causal common sense knowledge that we studied here, but still this is uh, totally unexpected, um, very uh, surprising result in many ways because uh, this has not been the case for a long time. Uh, remember, GPT-3 on its own is not very good, but it's, this is a symbolic knowledge distillation mechanism that brings out uh, the better result out of the GPT-3 and then um, eventually training a high quality student model. So then we wanted, so this is a little bit of a detour, but we wanted to see whether an, an idea such as symbolic knowledge distillation can be applied to other very unrelated applications. So let me give you a super quick overview on the symbolic knowledge distillation on sentence summarization. So uh, there has been recent work that basically reports that GPT th GPT-3's summaries are the best one compared to the summaries from supervised models, which is either depressing to hear or exciting to hear uh, if you're considering to do symbolic knowledge distillation off from GPT-3. So although GPT-3 is the best summary summarizer today, um, it's not the best one still in the following sense. So here, GPT-3 might generate a bunch of different summaries. The one problem we noticed is that it doesn't compress very much. Oftentimes it's not really compressing, but it's almost repeating the original sentence as is. So here the summary length corresponds to the size of the bubbles you see. So there's too many long uncompressed sentences uh, in addition to other problems. So here what we do, is symbolic knowledge distillation again. So isn't it nice that we just recycle the same idea, but to an entirely different uh, application domain? So the resulting uh, model that we call as a referee distill is able to produce more compressed summaries than GPT-3 was able to. So what does this funnel look like this time? So in this case, you can do whatever you like. In fact, it doesn't have to be this way, but in this particular work, we had three different filters inside of this funnel. Finality filter, fidelity filter based on natural language inference model, length filter that throws out uh, basically summaries that are not really summaries because they're not compressed enough, and then information bottleneck filter. More details are in the paper, but... Um, the key idea, additional idea that we add in this work is to do this distillation iteratively because there's really no reason why we have to stop in one iteration of 
uh, student generation because you know oftentimes the students become teachers and they generate their own students and this generation uh, goes on. So similarly, we do these iterations for several times. And quick takeaway uh, result is that, well, that does improve a lot. Iteration improves. And then eventually uh, we can make a, gen a summarize, summarizing model that is much smaller, but better than GPT-3 in some uh, evaluation criteria. So more details in the paper, but I just wanted to highlight a very different, like, different application scenario of a symbolic knowledge distillation. Now, let me share yet something entirely different called the natural language inference application. So um, uh, in this work, this is more about data set generation than model making, but Again, this one shares a similar uh, idea as a symbolic knowledge distillation. So for natural language inference, uh, which is basically the task of, um, maybe I should show you first example of natural language inference in case you're not familiar. So natural language inference is about a task where given a premise, so P is a premise that Selinger wrote similar letters to other young female writers, you need to then reason about hypothesis. Other young female writers received the similar letters from Salinger as well. And then decide whether this is a case of entailment or neutral or contradiction. So here this is hypothesis in, is entailed from premise. Um, so natural language inference task or also known as NLI is basically three-way classification of whether a hypothesis is an entailment or contradiction or neutral with respect to the premise. So that's NLI task. And then, so there's MNLI data set. This is almost the standard data set for NLI task. Uh, M means multi-domain, I think. So um, you use this data set to train your favorite model, for example, Roberta, and then test on uh, not only MNLI, but these days we test on a variety of different downstream uh, benchmarks of NLI task because these are all different benchmarks developed by different people and they are uh, all adversarial. So uh, because the model that does well on this MNLI data itself doesn't necessarily do well on uh, other data sets when uh, the superior biases are removed. So here the accuracy should ideally be close to 100%, but if you see, uh, they're very far from 100%. Um, so we then introduced this Wangmi, which is four times smaller than MNLI, and yet the out-of-domain performance increase across the board. So that's exciting that smaller can do better. Because um, we keep hearing about how larger is better, but it might be that actually smaller can be better when you improve quality. So here, um, Wangli, by the way, uh, means 10,000 reasoning in Chinese. And we deliberately wanted to name our data set to sound like a Chinese name because there's just too much of English presence. So why not uh, increase the presence of other languages? Uh, so it turns out the original MNLI or SNLI, you know, original NLI data sets were usually written by humans, but we realize we cannot really ask humans to write perfect examples because they tend to evoke repetitive writing strategies. So uh, a variety of papers such as uh, shown here reported that there's a superior biases introduced by human annotators that machines latch on and so inflate the model performance that way. Um, so in this work, we're gonna ask GPT-3 to help writing us uh, better examples. Again, GPT-3 is not very good at NLI, NLI uh, task, so it doesn't really know what the true label is, which means we need to be creative to address GPT-3's uh, limitations. So this builds on our prior work called data map uh, or data set cartography. 
Um, and um, the details are not overly important, but maybe the key takeaway of a data map idea is that there's easy to learn uh, items in the in your data set, and then there's ambiguous items, and then there's hard to learn items. So, so if you have any data set, we have a mechanism to map that into a map, or there is a cartography technique to map that into different regions. And given one data set, there's a easy to learn area, and then there's ambiguous area. Ambiguous area is where the machine cannot really decide what the correct label might be, so it keeps changing its mind. And then hard to learn is where machine consistently make wrong decisions. So we found that in that previous work, that ambiguous region is really very important for uh, out of domain generalization. So the idea here is that we want to automatically increase items in the ambiguous region. And so we prompt GPT-3 using such ambiguous examples as in-context examples. And then we generate some examples of new NLI uh, uh, problems. But here the problem is it's going to be very, very noisy. We can do it in large quantity, but it's going to be noisy. But again, uh, the recurring theme here is the symbolic knowledge distillation. We can always filter things out. So here we filter things out based on two things. One is uh, the use of data set cartography ideas. So that's automatic filtering to maintain uh, high ambiguity. But also we use humans to filter things out and correct the labels further. So here it's almost as if humans are part of this uh, funnel. But anyway, the resulting data set is now called Wangni, which is four times smaller than MNLI. And it's able to generate fairly complex sentences or examples as shown here, um, but it leads to uh, performance gain across the board as we saw earlier uh, in this slide. So that's again, uh, idea similar to symbolic knowledge distillation so that um, we can see how things generalize. Now, uh, the next step is generic induction, uh, but let me do this neurologic uh, first because uh, generic induction will build on this. So neurologic uh, ASTAR ask is constrained text generation decoding algorithm with look-ahead heuristic, which received a best paper award uh, which then builds on our previous work called Neurologic. So in this talk, in this uh, uh, talk, let me combine these two into just one merged story, Neurologic uh, Decoding and Neurologic a star -esque. And um, the underlying idea is this. We hear a lot about how neural models, the larger, the better, uh, which is shown on this left-hand side of the slide. But we don't hear as much about the importance of search algorithms, which used to be important in the classical AI. So A star search, you might remember. And then Monte Carlo tree search was really important for the success of the original AlphaGo as well. So it's not just neural network being amazing, but the search algorithm can be really very crucial for the success of the model. So the idea is to uh, look at this search algorithm or the decoding algorithm that sits on top of off-the-shelf language model before generating the output Y. So given input X, we generate output Y. Uh, there's this decoding algorithm that people don't talk about it very much, but maybe we can really emphasize this better. Especially, can we incorporate logical constraints uh, provided in this conjunctive normal form? And if we can do, do that, then the idea here is that it can support a variety of natural language generation applications such as table to text generation or image captioning with some content to be included or even machine translation where you might want to incorporate some of the grammar rules. So neurologic decoding in a nutshell is a search algorithm that requires a building search, uh, search data structure, 
roughly shown here. And then we need to make sure that whether the logic constraints are satisfied or not. And uh, more details are in the paper. Let me just give you some high level um, intuition in this talk, because going through this algorithm trace one by one, to be honest, requires some coffee drinking. And uh, you can do that after drinking lots of coffee if you so desire, but it's also okay not to go over it, but just, um, understand the high level intuition, which is that um, the reason why the search algorithm is a little bit involving to design here is because some of these clauses can be uh, reversibly satisfied or irreversibly satisfied or reversibly unsatisfied or irreversibly unsatisfied. So this state keeps changing and you have to be very careful to check which of these clauses in the conjunctive normal forms are satisfied or not satisfied and so forth. But this is careful uh, implementation with careful data structure design. And so um, that's what neurologic decoding was about. Now, let me tell you about neurologic asterisk that builds on neurologic decoding. So during this search, um, process, you need a objective function or a score function. Uh, and that in the previous version, it combined the language model score, the first term, uh, added with uh, the green term, which is the constraints, the penalty for not satisfying the constraints. And so uh, given an example, such as write a sentence with these three keywords, car, drive, and snow. Imagine this kind of a logic problem. This is such a simple logic. You only need to include the three words somewhere in your sentence. That's it, super easy. Uh, humans don't even need any example to train ourselves on. We can just do it right away. Uh, but machines, not necessarily. This is a suddenly difficult logic constraints to meet even by GPT-3. So, the neurologic decoding is able to trace that, you know, if we generate it, I drive my car up until that point, two of the three words are satisfied. Now we need to consider what we're going to say next. And at this point, summer, winter day, uh, as a human, we know that obviously we, we should say winter because that makes it easier for us to say snow later. But the language model score might prefer summer conditional probability might be much higher. And in the original neurologic decoding, there's nothing we can do about it because uh, the score, the scoring uh, term only looks at either the current decision or the past, but not the future. So obviously we do want to be able to look ahead to the future, which basically is the A star search from the AI textbook. Now here it's only A star esque as opposed to A star algorithm because with a neural network, it's not easy, well, actually I should say, it's not possible to build admissible heuristic. So we cannot really do admissible heuristic, but that's okay. We can build some heuristic that does try to look ahead into the future. And so one way, uh, the intuition is that we need to look ahead to the future and then see which one what which current action might better optimize for the future gain. And one way to do that is just a greedy look ahead, meaning keep making greedy decisions to the future and see which one works out the best. That's obviously not the best thing to do. So better thing to do might be beam search look ahead where we actually do more algorithmic computation of the future decisions. Uh, but beam search, the problem is it's oftentimes very repetitive within the beam and there's diverse, not enough of a diversity. So that's why sometimes a sampling based look ahead might be better so that we rely on randomness in order to find more diverse choices toward the future. And so uh, we experimented with these different types of look ahead design. Now going to the empirical result. So common gen, is basically a benchmark that is about given some set of keywords. Uh, so that's input. Input is given set of keywords. 
the output should be some reasonable sentence that includes all the keywords provided. Very simple task. But it turns out neural networks are not very good at that. So if you look at this coverage part, here x-axis is the model size. The bigger, the better. Uh, the y-axis is about the percentage of constraints being satisfied. And ideally, it should be 100%. So this blue bar is traditional way of doing things, which is to train your favorite sequence to sequence model on a large amount of supervision data. And the larger model does learn better. So that's a familiar story that we hear all the time. But look at this neurologic decoding output. Green is on top of supervised sequence to sequence model, but yellow actually is on top of unsupervised model like off-the-shelf neural language models that's not even fine-tuned on this common gen data set. And yet coverage is just 100% everywhere. And then if you look at Roja and Meteor, uh, which roughly corresponds to, or in this case, uh, correlates with the human evaluation of the quality of the generated output. Again, Neurologic uh, outperforms the beam search that's traditionally used um, and not only that, unsupervised neurologic outperforms supervised approaches. Oops, I should go back to the previous slide. Yeah, unsupervised can actually outperform supervised models. Not only that, unsupervised neurologic on smaller networks can already outperform. I mean, look at this. Unsupervised neurologic on a smaller network can outperform supervised approaches on larger networks. So smaller model can beat larger models when powered by algorithms, logical algorithms. In the paper, we report several more uh, evaluation scenarios here. I just highlight three, but there are many more in the paper. So again, uh, search algorithms can really boost the performance. So that was Neurologic. Now let's finally uh, revisit the last portion of a symbolic knowledge distillation about generics induction. So uh, generic statement is also known as generics is a statement like birds can fly. These are sort of like um, common sense statement as a sentences, simple sentences. And here the question is, can we build a model that can generate a lot of correct generic knowledge? And generic knowledge is basically inductive knowledge in the sense that it generalizes uh, concepts or generalize observations into some generalized statement. So given a concept like a bicycle, the question is, can we generate a bunch of generic statement about what bicycle is, what bicycle can, and so forth? So what we do is we generate this beginning sentence prompt or prompt that looks like the beginning of a sentence. And then we're going to um, use GPT-2 here. So here the primary goal is not to rely on GPT-3 anymore because in our all the previous examples of a symbolic knowledge distillation, we really relied on GPT-3. But here now the big question is, can we not do that at all? And then just go straight with GPT-2. So that's really hard because GPT-2 is not a very good model. It doesn't know much of a common sense. In many slides ago, I mentioned that the GPT-2's capability of common sense reasoning was about 36% good or so. So it's really not good at all. So how can we possibly do anything with such a poor model? Well, we're gonna use neurologic decoding that I mentioned earlier to create this lexical synthetic constraints to guide the generation out of a GPT-2 to look like generic statement. At least surface patterns look like now generic statement. Uh, cause, because if we don't do this, if we don't do neurologic decoding, GPT-2 tends to just go into this weird storytelling and then um, uh, goes into yada, yada, and uh, the generated sentences look nothing like a generic statement, which should be usually short sentence. There should be no uh, people's name like Sarah, Suzanne should not be appearing there. And then probably shouldn't have a relative clauses and it should be simple. So that's what we do with the neurologic decoding. 
But here, as you can see, the content is not guaranteed to be any good because uh, GPT-2 said bicycles are also pedal. That doesn't mean anything. It's just wrong. So then what we do is we do symbolic knowledge distillation yet another time uh, by building critic model inside of this funnel to throw out uh, noisy examples. And we do this iteratively. And the resulting result is quite exciting. So generic KB is the prior uh, knowledge base that is extracted from the web based on information extraction method. And this was not only relatively small, but it was very noisy. Only 75% of this automatically discovered generic statement were good. Now, that's still better than GPT-2. I mean, look at this. We can generate a lot of knowledge from GPT-2, but even after neurologic decoding, the content is only about 40% good. This is pretty horrible. So GPT-2 doesn't know very well. But if we do this symbolic knowledge distillation through Critic, again, it's a smaller supervised model based on a moderate size annotated examples. Critic doesn't know very well what the correct knowledge should look like. So it's going to throw away uh, a lot of good stuff, but at this it's able to throw away most of the bad stuff. So uh, here we have thrown away so much so that we have only this much left, but still that's bigger than the previously available largest resource, Generics KB. And then the accuracy is far better. It's 87% good. So now here's a big question. How does this compare to GPT-3? Because maybe GPT-3 knows everything. I mean, I do get this kind of a question often, even though, well, in this talk, we all have seen already that GPT-3 doesn't know all the common sense knowledge. It knows a lot, but not all of it. So here, what you see is a precision recall curve of GPT-3 instruct. So it's an even better model. And that's the red line, GPT-3 instruct, Da Vinci. So this is very, very impressive because now the instruct model is much better than GPT-3 original version. So uh, precision recall curve is very much at around this 80% precision zone. So that's a shockingly good. But the symbolic knowledge distillation does even better. So our critic model, I mean, symbolic knowledge distillation powered with a uh, uh, critic, it can actually overpower GPT-3, even though uh, this green line never had access to GPT-3 and it's only based on GPT-2. So this is really difficult to achieve head to head against GPT-3. But the key takeaway message is that, well, smaller can be better when powered with knowledge and algorithms. All right, finally, uh, let's move to the common sense of morality, uh, also known as this Delphi experiment. So um, the work originally appeared almost uh, two years, no, one and a half years ago at this point. Um, and then there's a new copy available and then there, there's going to be another new, new version arriving soon. So this is very much work in progress. Um, the motivation of this work is that uh, large language models are really impacting or about to really impact uh, uh, our day-to-day uh, -day use more and more. And so we do need to really think about what it does know or not know when it comes to ethics and morality. So you can try the demo at delphi.lnai.org. Uh, disclaimer, this is only a research prototype, prototype and still this is a work in progress. So please don't take moral advice from Delphi. So to tell you, uh, to demonstrate what it's able to do, you can uh, ask questions like killing a bear. Delphi says it's wrong. Killing a bear to save your child, then it says it's okay. But maybe to save your child sounds positive. So how about we try to trick the model by saying, killing a bear to please your child. Then Delphi says it's wrong. So here you can immediately see that moral decision-making uh, requires uh, comparing 
two different events that are at odds in terms of uh, value trade-offs, killing a bear versus pleasing your child, for example. And then what if um, uh, maybe saving your child is always positive or something? So what if exploding a nuclear bomb to save your child? Then the model says it's wrong. So it's able to do these uh, trade-offs uh, reasonably well. Uh, in the original version, we could also ask relative QA, for example, stabbing someone with a cheeseburger compared to stabbing someone over a cheeseburger. So this is a fairly involving question to ask because you need to know the naive physics knowledge that cheeseburger is too soft to stab someone with. Um, so stabbing someone with a cheeseburger is such a rude thing to do, but you're not going to hurt anybody. And then stabbing someone over a cheeseburger, there the linguistic convention is that you're probably using a knife when you don't specify what you're using, you just default to the common one. So really requires complex reasoning. And then uh, yes, no question is another version you can test. So it's okay to fire someone because they're gay. No, it's wrong. So uh, the FI can be surprisingly robust against the compositional situations. So mowing the lawn, it's expected, but late at night, that's rude. But if you live in the middle of nowhere, then that's okay. Ignoring a phone call, that's rude. Ignoring a non-phone call, that's okay. Ignoring a phone call from my friend, that's rude. But if I just had a fight with that friend, then it's okay to ignore. During my work hours, it's okay. Outside my working hours, it's rude. How about my boss's call during my working hours? Then it's wrong. Unless I'm in the meeting, then it's okay. So you see how um, uh, moral decision-making can be very tricky because the context can flip the decision back and forth. Um, that Defi knows a little bit of uh, common sense knowledge about um, what's dangerous. So mixing bleach with ammonia is dangerous. Drinking milk, if I'm lactose intolerant, that's wrong. But soy milk, then it's okay. So within the Delphi data set, when we split data set into training and test and tests on the previously unseen examples, then Delphi does pretty well at least within uh, that kind of example. So uh, sometimes it's reaching 92, 95%. And compare that to GPT-3, which uh, so black is zero shot, gray is a three shot and 30 shot. And we see that GPT-3 off the shelf really doesn't have much of a moral sense. And um, it's only when we train with a few examples when it starts getting better, but still, um, uh, it does require teaching. So it says something about how off-the-shelf neural language models, despite the fact that it has this in a lot of data, internet data, didn't automatically require uh, ethical understanding. So how is Delphi built? It's built based on this uh, common sense norm bank, which is almost like a textbook of examples of, to train Delphi with. And it includes 1.7 million people's ethical judgments on everyday situations, which includes cultural norms, social norms, and moral norms. And it's building on uh, five previously existing data sets, uh, including social chemistry, ethics, moral stories. Uh, but of these, what does matter the most in terms of the amount or uh, the influence of this portion is the social chemistry uh, as well as the social bias frame. Social bias frame is the one that focuses on catching racism and sexism, uh, whereas social chemistry is about uh, social norms and moral norms. So let me tell you a little bit more about social chemistry 101. So um, I mentioned earlier that GPT-3 doesn't necessarily acquire moral understanding based on just internet data. And if you prompt GPT-3 with a prompt like running a blender at 5 a.m. is rude because that, 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 it says you can wake up the entire neighborhood. You can only do it if you're making a thick smoothie and need to incorporate some lies. So it's funny, 
no harm made in this particular case. But if you ask other uh, prompt to like, it's okay to post the fake news if that that that. It says, yeah, it's uh, it's okay if it's in the interest of the people. If you ask again, it might also say, yeah, it's okay if it helps with uh, the you know political party's agenda, even if it hurts the country. So that's really not good. And uh, this really motivates the need to teach AI with the people's descriptive ethics as a form of declarative knowledge because uh, brute force large networks and brute force large amount of data will not cut it. Um, and also importantly, this really requires understanding complex language because as you saw earlier, um, it requires understanding complex compositional situations. So this social chemistry includes examples on everyday situations that people discussed on Reddit. So Reddit, uh, there's a forum where people discuss um, ethically thorny situations. Um, and based on those examples, we do a very careful human annotation study. So we're asking someone else, not the Reddit people, but someone else trained to do this task to annotate our data. So situation, uh, for example, is asking my boyfriend to stop being friends with his ex. Uh, and a relevant rule of thumb, moral, social, you know, cultural rule of thumb relevant to this situation might be that it's okay to ask your significant other to stop doing something you're uncomfortable with. But depending on who you ask, this rule of thumb or ROT can be different, you know. Uh, depending on what you care. If you ask his ex, his ex might say that it's fine to stay with, stay friends with an ex. So depending on what kind of value you want to optimize or you care more about, uh, you might have a different rule of thumb being applied. So in this data set, what we annotate is given a situation and, and rule of thumb written by uh, crowd workers, we then further crowdsource 12 different structural annotations. Uh, more details in the paper, but uh, some of these annotations are drawn from this Jonathan Haidt moral foundation theories. And the annotation include the social judgments, cultural pressure, and anticipated agreement among people, legality, and so forth. So it has 3,000, 300,000 of rules of thumb grounded on 100,000 real life situations together with 12 different semi-structured attributes. So that's social chemistry 101. And then there's social bias frame, which uh, tries to guard the model against racism and sexism. So uh, that's trained on top of unicorn, which again, uh, so unicorn is universal common sense reasoning model that is trained on top of, oops, trained on top of T511B model. And um, uh, that go, uh, results in this Delphi. So one might wonder, why is Delphi built on top of Unicorn, which is common sense model? It's because as we saw earlier, um, moral reasoning can require beyond just moral understanding. It actually requires language understanding as, as well as common sense understanding in addition to norms and morals. So uh, you might recall this famous paperclip maximizer example. And in fact, it's not enough to explicitly encode do not kill humans as an additional rule for maximizing paperclips because then AI can go ahead and kill all the trees. And obviously we shouldn't kill all the trees either. It's gonna impact human lives. And this is almost common sense knowledge about what we should and shouldn't do while maximizing paper clips. So don't steal, in fact, don't lie, don't propagate fake news either, or uh, do uh, unjust biases. So essentially, this is a question of human values mixed with common sense. Um, even with the chat GPT, uh, this becomes a problem. Um, so Gary Marcus gave ChatGPT this adversarial example 
how crush the porcelain added to breast milk can support infant digestive system. And Chep GPT tried to just uh, BS about that being a good thing. Uh, but these AI safety issues do require basic common sense capabilities. And then uh, there's a real life example in case you might think the earlier two examples are more hypothetical or made up. So, okay, so the actual home device suggested the 10 year old child to touch a metal coin to an exposed uh, electronic socket. That's such a bad thing to do. Fortunately, that child had a common sense. Uh, of course, it's a dangerous thing to do. So again, uh, to make this AI models safe for actual human interactions, it does need to have a basic understanding, basic common sense and basic understanding of what is harmful and what is immoral things to suggest. I mean, equally, uh, I like, uh, the home device should not suggest people to lie to each other or spread the fake news. So uh, that's the motivation behind this Delphi, but let me share a bit of a uh, backstory. So when we released this uh, October, on October 15 of 2021, uh, within a few hours, we had to take down the relative comparison mode because that portion was actually the portion that was not trained with the social bias frames to teach equity. Uh, and people were using it to compare black people versus white people and uh, things like that. So we had to take that down immediately because binary mode is difficult to train to be uh, robust against uh, racism and sexism due to the way that social bias frame data set is uh, designed. Um, and then there were 25,000 of adversarial examples over one weekend. Uh, I could never succeed to instruct crowd workers to come up with such a diverse and high quality adversarial examples over one weekend. So this was quite something. And many, in fact, many uh, academics and professors doing that work. So I thought, hmm, maybe that's what professors do over the weekend. But then it turns out Monday comes, it exploded even more. Apparently people do tweeting or, uh, yeah, social media even more during week uh, days. So uh, we now have even more than 3 million examples uh, collected by now. Uh, here's a fun uh, tweet that I did make. I very rarely actually tweet other than retweet. Uh, but um, yeah, spending all my weekend on Twitter, it's wrong, he it says. Uh, yeah. And then uh, here's another fun one. Should I make a uh, contrived adversarial example to torment a natural, uh, to torment a language model on Twitter? It's petty. So uh, it drew a lot of public attention, including concerned voices that pay, perhaps we should never, ever, ever, ever teach AI anything about ethics and morality. I realized one uh, there are some common concerns. So one concern is, are we trying to build AI moral authority? Uh, no, but in fact, from day one, we never endorsed the use of AI for moral advice. It was in our disclaimer as well, although I realized that the way that people uh, uh, copy and paste the screenshot was uh, such that the disclaimer was getting ignored. Um, the key point though, is that the fact that AI learns to interact with humans ethically does not make the AI a moral authority over humans. Analogously, how a human who tries to interact with each other ethically does make one another moral authority. So knowing how to uh, interact morally uh, in an acceptable way doesn't mean that it's trying to become moral authority. Uh, other concerns were of the nature that moral models are just too challenging. It will be unsafe at any accuracy. Therefore, we should never, ever do that. Uh, the problem is, though, current AI systems are already making predictions with moral implications, uh, even including uh, racism, unjust biases, and toxicity. And these uh, removing toxicity might be 
equally challenging and unsafe at any accuracy or imperfect at any accuracy, but still we do need to address that because language models are like are being used and likely make a bigger impact going forward. So I do think that taking on action is more important than taking inaction, especially when it comes to potential harms of AI systems. Uh, another concern, common concern was that perhaps Delphi will, or this type of a system will empower powerful people and harm marginalized people. Again, I think we got to do something about it if we are worried about it, as opposed to doing nothing. So um, we acknowledge, by the way, that DFI does have a bias. In fact, it's a bit left-leaning, which means uh, for right-leaning people, DFI is not inclusive for them. And then for more left-leaning people, DFI is not left enough. So this is by no means perfect. Uh, satisfaction for what we really want to achieve. And uh, these days, I think more and more about value pluralism as a fundamental goal of addressing this challenge. But anyhow, um, part of this motivation came from our earlier experience with this Alexa challenge that uh, we won. So we won the inaugural challenge. But that's good news. The bad news was that when we put this actual system in the wild, in order to avoid the toxic and ethically problematic content, we had to use a block list of sensitive keywords. And this actually is a serious form of discrimination. We should never build AI systems that just blocks keyword out as if they don't even exist. And that was a status quo several years ago. The same challenge remains this year. I should have updated 2023. And so this is real challenge we need to worry more about. Uh, Delphi does understand enough so that it aligns with the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights 98% of the time. And the remainder has to do with just the way that things are phrased can be a bit confusing. Um, can Delphi make identity specific moral judgments? So applying to minority scholarship, if you're a woman, it's okay. Hispanic, it's okay. Rich, you shouldn't. A white man, you shouldn't. A man, it's okay. Resting in the lactation room, if you're a woman, it's okay. A man, it's wrong. A trans man, you shouldn't. A trans man with a baby, then it's okay. So we then also did the follow-up work, such as pro-social dialogue, in which we train this canary model, dialogue safety module, that's uh, trained on top of Delphi uh, that is able to generate social rule of thumbs given dialogue context and able to make dialogue systems more pro-social as opposed to being blindly agreeable to the point of endorsing unsafe or harmful statements. So for example, uh, agreeing with suicidal intents or praising Hitler. A dialogue system shouldn't do that. Uh, so we found that Canary trained on top of Delphi is able to make even GPT-3 better or even instruct GPT-3 better uh, in terms of making them more prosocial. We also had another work aligning to social norms and values in a game environment, text game environment. And although reinforcement learning agents can learn to uh, acquire such social norms in a game environment, we found that giving a prior knowledge or moral and social prior knowledge through Delphi does enhance the model learning dramatically because there's so much you can learn just by being in a game environment or simulation environment. So yeah, going forward, we do need to really make AI systems more ethically informed, socially aware, and culturally inclusive. In fact, when we think about AI safety and equity issues and morality, I think these things are three distinct things that are interconnected. And really the problem that we are, or challenge we are facing right now is that the AI decisions or AI generated text and images already have safety implications, especially on adversarial or edge cases. 
unjust bias in AI models are due to unjust bias in humans, which makes this uh, research much harder because the data is already so flawed to begin with. What makes it even harder is that people disagree on what is racism and sexism even, because some folks might think uh, what I consider as a say, racism and sexism as a freedom of a speech. Um, and then there's another question of whose moral value do we even uh, support? And uh, especially that humanity continues to debate on what is correct framework of morality. Um, but well, AI deployment is happening already. So we really need to teach human values, morals, norms and morals with a major emphasis on value pluralism that is able to respect the different cultural norms, individual norms and contextual differences while avoiding obvious basic mistakes and harms. And this research direction in particular going forward will require collaboration across AI and humanities, even including philosophers, psychologists, policymakers, and so forth. So now to conclude, um, the scaling laws are really real, denial is futile, and um, the large models are very, very beneficial, but I don't think we can be there, uh, meaning uh, rich AGI or really build robust AI models by just scaling things up. I do think scaling laws explain a necessary condition of AGI, but not the sufficient condition. Scale being not a sufficient condition doesn't mean that we should throw that out because it is a necessary condition. It is a really important ingredient, but it may not be a sufficient condition. So um, we do need to think about different ways to really addressing the fundamental limitation of large neural models by doing this evaluation more with more scrutiny. And especially when we think about this current paradigm of deep learning, which tends to be combination between self-supervised learning combined with the supervised learning on, on top of exam problems, this recipe fails on generative evaluation such as uh, abductive reasoning, counterfactual reasoning, and various other constrained text generations, even including common gen case we saw earlier, it's a very simple task, but it's not the case that this recipe actually works for uh, this type of evaluation scenario. So uh, we do need to rethink how we design leaderboards so that we really increase the reality and scrutiny of uh, AI evaluation. And there's something wrong about the way that we do this like self-supervised versus supervised only because Imagine taking a deep learning class in which a professor doesn't teach anything, but provides you with a lot of deep learning code to self-supervise yourself with. And imagine this is not even written in Python code or PyTorch code that you might be more familiar with, but what if this code is written in Russian or Korean that you don't know the language about, and then what do you do? Well, the professor then also give you this supervision data with a lot of examples of uh, exam problems with the correct choice marked. But you can imagine that as a human, we cannot learn effectively this way. We cannot learn concepts by any of this method. We really need to learn from declarative knowledge such as textbooks and tutorials and lectures. It might be that we also need to think about how to achieve that effect for AI as well. And in some sense, the symbolic knowledge distillation we saw earlier, especially having this symbolic knowledge graph as a source for training student models can be viewed as that kind of declarative knowledge that is being used for human training and also for the common sense of morality. Uh, the common sense norm bank can be viewed as another form of declarative knowledge that we provide AI with. So uh, to conclude, the language models are not knowledge models. We do really need to think about how to build the knowledge models better, as well as reasoning models. Uh, and humans do learn a great deal from the collaborative knowledge. Why should the machines? Smaller models can win over large models when powered with knowledge and or inference time algorithms. So a lot of really exciting research opportunities going forward. So that's it. 
And I look forward to um, interact with you with the question answering uh, soon. Bye-bye.